Okay, so good afternoon. Um, so this talk, as I said, will be a little bit different. Uh, we heard about yesterday and today about all uh, HPC side, both uh, from the programming models, MPI, PGAS. Uh, but this will be a little bit different uh, talk, and we have been working on this area for the last two years. Uh, so the idea is that we heard so much also in today, like from the big data. Okay, so that is the kind of the new things are coming. And broadly, we are trying to see how high performance networks can actually be used in this environment and what we can do to really accelerate the Hadoop. And it has multiple components, HDFS, MapReduce, and HBase, and also MemcasD, uh, which is being used in the Web 2.0 um, area. So that would be kind of the broad talk I'll be giving here. Now, if you say the, the, like the quick introduction, these days we see always we hear about big data, the rate of information growth appears to be exceeding Moore's law, and all these different environments, the companies are trying to capture all this data, digitize them. And if you refer to this report, it says that 35 jettabytes, so that is the, we are going into the jettabytes range, um, will be generated and consumed by the end of this decade. So the question is, how do we handle this, this big data? Now here it shows very nice thing. Uh, this was a uh, graph of uh, 1,026 Twitter users. Um, it was, this data was collected over a period of eight hours and 24 minutes, just saying how many tweets are going in an eight hour time frame using the phrase big data, okay? So just in the Twitter community. So you will see that all different kinds of things, people are referring to big data analytics, to big data cloud, big data jobs even. Um, this again, big data analytics, uh, uh, here different kinds of application environments in the social media. So, so a lot of people have been talking about this, this big data. Now, so that is the kind of application and here we, if we see the technology, especially the networking technologies, uh, many of you might have seen these charts. These are again the top 500 uh, charts, uh, but trying to show the, uh, the networking technology, how it has evolved, evolved over the years. Uh, so this is like the interconnect family, which is the systems here. That is the number of systems out of 500. If you take like a 2005, out of 500 systems, how many were Ethernet, how many were InfiniBand, how many were like crossbar, these kind of numbers. And this is the right hand side is the performance here. Like out of those top 500 systems, if you accumulate the performance of those machines, again, how they compare all these different interconnects. And here it is, you'll see that this is the, these are the two broad things, Ethernet and InfiniBand. Um, a lot of debates have been going on over the years. Um, so here the InfiniBand, which is the, the light yellow kind of things, uh, it started in the 2000, but gradually it started growing, and this is where you see the, the number of InfiniBand systems in the top 500 have been growing over the years. And that is in the total number, but here is the performance-wise. So if you see the performance-wise, InfiniBand delivers much more performance than the Ethernet. Um, uh, gradually like this, this, this is widening. But at the same time, you'll see that there are a lot of uh, proprietary systems. They are also contributing to a lot of the performance, like the case supercomputer, uh, those kind of uh, systems. But here in the talk, we'll mostly focusing on the, on the commodity side. So as we saw like uh, in two of my talks and all, also from the other talks, uh, the high performance computing has adopted the advanced interconnection protocols like InfiniBand side, uh, 10 gig Ethernet, IWARP also is getting momentum. Things are moving into the 40 gig gradually there. And of course, the convergence, which is the RDM over converged enhanced Ethernet or Rocky, is also steadily gaining the, the momentum. And they deliver very good performance. We saw all these different numbers. Um, latency wise, we can get in few microseconds. Bandwidth, especially with the dual FTR InfiniBand, you can get 100 gigabits per second. And the third one, which is the very important also in all these modern interconnects, is the low CPU overhead or the CPU utilization. So we can get all this performance with low CPU utilization so that the maximum amount of the CPU cycles are left for the, the computation or the applications. Okay. Now, and especially many of you must be familiar with Open Fabric software stack, and that has now the IB, IWARP, and Rocky interfaces, so they are all integrated, and that is driving the HPC systems and many such systems in the top 500 list. And of course, MPI designs have been there, uh, parallel file systems, storage systems. So, so all these modern systems on the HPC side have adopted all these high performance networks. So, so almost you will see that since InfiniBand was introduced in the October 2000, it is 12 point, uh, what, 
five months, 12 years and five months. So a lot of things have happened in the research development in this time frame and also other programming models I talked about like UPC, OpenSpam, hybrid, they are coming. But now if you change the focus saying, okay, what is happening on the enterprise side? What is happening on the big data? Are they ready to, to take this networking technologies? You will see a very different answer and that's what will be the focus of my talk. So as we saw some of the talks like uh, this big data enterprise, they always focus on the large data and data analytics and Hadoop is one of the environment which is getting a lot of momentum. I'll go into much more depth there and memcached, which is also another component which is used in the web 2.0. So the question broadly we need to ask here, can high performance interconnects benefit enterprise computing? Okay. Now if you see that most of these current enterprise systems actually use one gig E. There is always concerns for performance and scalability. Um, and usage of high performance network is just beginning to draw some interest. Okay. And we saw in some of the earlier talks, like all these different companies, Oracle, IBM, Google, they're all working in the directions. They already have some of the deployments, so the cloud deployments. Uh, with high performance networks. But the broad thing is that it has not been completely gone and been explored in the big data, the Hadoop, Memcached area. So the question is, what are the challenges? And where do the bottlenecks lie? And can these bottlenecks be alleviated with new designs, similar to designs like let's say, well, as we have done in the MPI. So MPI is just like a middleware. If you think Hadoop, there is a different middleware. So can the, all the lessons learned from the MPI stack design or program models design can be moved into the Hadoop side or not. So that's what we have been um, working on and I'll share some of our experiences and where, where things uh, lie. Uh, so before going there, I'll briefly overview, provide an overview of Hadoop. If some of you are not familiar how these systems look like, I'll go into the details of HDFS, MapReduce and HBase and Memcached. Then go into some of the challenges in accelerating this kind of enterprise middleware. And then I'll show some designs and case studies on the Hadoop side. We'll take component by component, like HDFS, which is a file system layer. We'll see how much performance benefits we can get. Then we'll talk about the MapReduce, then HBase, and then we'll try to combine some of these components because you can get the benefits by combining some of these designs. And then a uh, little bit in the memcached and then I'll conclude. So this is the kind of a picture many of you might have seen. This is the overall like the Hadoop um, infrastructure. So what it is like a Apache Hadoop is an open source implementation of the Mac MapReduce programming model uh, for big data. So broadly at a high level it looks like this. HDFS which is the file system is sitting here. Then we have the MapReduce framework here and then the HBase which is the database component uh, side of the Hadoop. And uh, these are like uh, it got introduced to the uh, with the Ethernet environment and uh, the goal is that it can scale, you distribute the data and then do the distributed processing. Um, it scales but uh, there is also a high amount of communication during some of these intermediate phases and this is where the bottlenecks come. And then the question is that can high performance networks um, help there. And this was like the individual component by component. So this is the HDFS architecture. So broadly you will see a set of data nodes here and uh, then there is a name node the client is here, there is another component called Jukeeper. So the primary storage of the Hadoop is that it is a highly reliable and fault tolerant in the sense you don't keep a single copy, you keep multiple copies or you replicate them, you can, the default is three, but you can do whatever types of replication you want so that the data exists at multiple places. And it is actually being used in many of the uh, commercial environment like the Facebook and Yahoo, uh, the name node here stores the file system namespace like where the data lies in the different data nodes and then the data nodes actually stores the data block. Now this is a key thing that this framework was developed in Java, okay? But the primary goal was for portability, okay? But if some of you know or worked with Java, it doesn't do, deliver very good performance. So they are not uh, exactly portability and performance. Uh, there is a trade-off here and this is where the bottlenecks happen and at the same time it uses sockets for communication. That is also the third dimension and we'll see how to alleviate that, okay. Now the, at a uh, communication level, this is like the how the clients, HDFS clients talk to the HDFS, um, the data nodes and these data nodes can have hard disk or, or SSDs and this is where the communications take place between the clients and the, and the, um, uh, the data nodes. 
Now then if you take a look at the edge base, so this is how it, the architecture looks like. So we have the HDFS. So the, then there is a edge base region servers, then there is a edge base master, and then there is an edge base client, and they're connected with the Zookeeper. So it basically handles semi-structured database, uh, which is highly scalable. And this is also again an integral part of many data center applications like Facebook and Ahu. Um, some of them use this. And this is also same because it's Apache framework. So it is developed in Java and also it uses sockets. So if you see the communication framework here, so we see two tiered approach here. So the first one is like the HDFS, the, uh, the data nodes are here. And then these are the edge region servers and they ca can communicate with the, with the data nodes with the high performance networks. And then the clients also talk to the region servers with another layers of uh, the high performance network. So it's like a two tier um, approach here. Then the Memcache D architecture, so this is more like an integral part of the web 2.0. So the broadly the idea here is to have a distributed caching layer, okay? And what it does is in pictorial, if you see like these are the like the memcached servers in any like a multi-tier data center. So you'll see the database servers here, memcached servers here, and these are the front end servers or the memcached clients. But what, what it's done is that in these memcached servers, if you see the architecture, like we have some amount of like a main memory, CPUs, SSD or hard disk, you can aggregate some parts of the main memory. So if you take main memory from all these different nodes, so let's say even if you take like a, the modern servers have 32 gigabytes of, of memory per node, uh, if you take like even a two gigabytes or four gigabytes from 16 of these servers, then that itself can contribute to like a 64 gigabytes. And, and that is like a distributed caching layer. And if you can keep a lot of data, which are hot, hot data in that, that area or the frequently accessed data, uh, so then all the queries which are coming, can get very quickly served uh, from that uh, distributed caching so that your request or, uh, or the response time will be very uh, low and the, your transaction rate will go up, okay? So that is the broad idea here. And this allows to aggregate the spare memory from multiple nodes. And I said it's uh, typically used for caching the database query, results of the API calls. It is a scalable model, but at the same time, the usage is very network intensive, okay? because you are thinking of a distributed cache, a lot of queries are coming. You need to see the direct, these queries to the appropriate nodes, get the data and then send it back, okay? So those are the kind of architecture we'll be, we'll be focusing on. Any questions so far? Afternoon, we had very nice risotto, you know? <laughs> so, so we have to remain awake. So you ask me questions, I can also remain awake, okay? So there are no questions, let's, let's continue. So the question is, if we take this kind of architecture, how do we, what are the challenges? So just like these challenges are no different than let's say the, the figure I introduced yesterday, but it will be a little bit different form. So I can start with saying, look, commodity systems are coming these days, like uh, all the single core, um, dual core, quad core, multi, many accelerators all are there. Then all these networking technologies are coming. And more importantly, here we have to worry about the hard disk drive and the SSDs because we are talking about big data. This is where the, uh, they reside. So we need to take those architectures into account. So this is what, again, I, I indicate like a supply side. That means the technology is giving us, okay? The modern technologies we are seeing, tremendous growth here, here, and here. Now the top side, we see these are the, like the big data applications we are talking about. So that is like our demand side. And these are written with some data center middleware. These are the, all the architectures I described, HDFS, HBase, MapReduce, Memcached, et cetera. And then the programming models currently is the socket, okay? So now somehow we need to see that how we take the performance and scalability advantages of these technologies and deliver to this layer or a little bit variation to this layer, okay? Because this is sockets. If we can replace that sockets with something else, we'll, we'll see. So then we can deliver the performance scalability here, and then your end big data applications can actually benefit, okay? So this is where then the challenges come to how do you really design this communication and I libraries? And here I have just outlined some of the things. Of course, there are multiple more issues, uh, like scheduling, uh, those kind of issues, I'm not put it here. But here, like, how do we handle this point-to-point -point communication? How do we handle the IO and file systems? How do we handle threading models and synchronizations, quality of service, fault tolerance? So these are the components which I see as the challenges to, to bridge the gap from the supply side to the demand side. 
okay? And this is no different if you take a look at the picture I showed yesterday for the programming models, they are very similar, okay? So we are just talking about software and then the technology and how do we, how do we match? Now this is a very dense slide, but this uh, summarizes all the things, actions are happening in the open fabrics, software stack, many of you might have seen this, uh, the open fabrics uh, software stack, which uh, has been again evolved over the beginning of the infinite for the last 12 years, uh, captures all these different technologies. So if you see here applications, so there are two paths, either the applications are written with sockets or they have been rewritten with, with bars. When I say this application, it could be any middleware also, it doesn't have to be the end applications. So, so that is the kind of an application interface, either it's the sockets or the bars. Now on the protocol space, there are a lot of these choices. So on the leftmost side, these we can say that the traditional one, like uh, here you go through the kernel space TCP IP. On the pure ethernet side, we go through the ethernet driver, ethernet adapter. So these are the 1, 10, 40 gigi environment, okay? And then of course, this is the same TCP IP, but goes through IP over IB through the infinite adapter. So this is any infinite environment can also provide that interface through the IP over IB um, emulation. And then the, the same 1040 gigi, but it can also go with the TCP IP with the hardware offload, and these are the two solutions, okay? So I group them all together saying these are like, if your application or middleware is sockets, you can take advantage of any of these um, combinations. Now there is of course over the years, there has been work on this STP, uh, the sockets direct protocol stack. So it again takes the same sockets, but it uses the RDMA mechanisms of InfiniBand and the InfiniBand adapter and the switches to give you the um, STP environment. There are the extreme one is the actually the IB verbs. So your application or middleware needs to be rewritten with the verbs and that goes through the user level RDMA and this can run with the InfiniBand adapter and the InfiniBand switch, okay? So that's the native IB verbs um, level solution. And recently there is some momentum going on, you'll be hearing there's some project uh, called R sockets is being led by Intel and all. So they're trying to take the similar sockets and but trying to provide in the user space and then so that you can run on the infinite fabric with, with better performance, okay? So that is still being worked out. And then intermediate ones are the iWarp and the Rocky, okay? So in this talk, I'll try to focus on this side. Like most of the um, environments here we'll see on the big data side, they lie on this side and how can we take it to the, to the extreme right so that those middlewares, if they can be written just like MPI was written or uh, rewritten with, with IB verbs and which is enabling all these top 500 systems, so why can't we do that for, for big data? So, so let's try to abstract this into a simpler form. So if we see the current designs, like uh, as I indicated, like there is an application, there is a socket, so everybody goes through the sockets um, and, and use this one to 10 gigi network. There have been some solutions, you will see that some accelerated sockets from all different vendors, you will say, okay, X has accelerated this Hadoop or some all different terminologies and things are coming up. So the, here the idea is that some parts of the sockets have been accelerated. Now, but broadly if you see, there is a little bit of mismatch in the sense the sockets traditionally, they were not designed for high performance, that means the sockets are the stream semantics they often mismatch for the upper layers. And also for many of the sockets design, the zero copy solution is not available, which you see in, in terms of the, the IB force. So here the, our, the goal is that if we take like the extreme right from the previous picture, we have either like 10 gigi Rocky um, or iWarp for InfiniBand, if you see this, so they are using verbs interface and, and we have this big data application here, can we really bridge this gap? Okay, so if you can come up with a verbs level design, then we should be able to run all these uh, different components of the Hadoop and MCAS-D directly on InfiniBand or with, or with iWarp or with Rocky, then you should be able to see the performance benefit. Now another thing also we need to uh, take a look and I'll show some um, numbers there. There is a very interesting interplay between storage and interconnect protocols, okay? So sometimes it is like a, uh, a chicken and egg issue. Because many times, let's say the, because we are talking about the big data, if, if the data is in the, let's say the hard disk and the hard disk becomes the bottleneck, then it doesn't matter whether you use ethernet versus InfiniBand or any of the high performance networks, you will not see any benefits, okay? But on the other hand, if you replace the hard disk drive with an SSDs or with some very high end file systems and all, so then you will see they are matching. So that means high performance networks will give you benefits, okay? So this has been a little bit like a um, chicken and egg 
And over the years, people use this for their own benefit. Some people say, look, I, I run these experiments, I replace Ethernet with, with Infinium, and I don't see any benefit. They are correct, okay? But, but, the, but it's not the issue of the high performance network. There is an imbalance in the system. There is one component which is slower, and if you replace it with another component, you don't expect to see the benefits, okay? And, and uh, this is like the example I give uh, sometimes in my class. Let's say if you take a very old car, okay? It has an old engine, and then you replace the tires with very modern tires. Do you expect it to run fast? No, okay? So, so you need to rethink whether you are trying to design a balanced car, okay? Or a high performance car so that all the components are matching. The so same thing is happening in this environment. So we can't just take only one part and then try to replace it um, and, and expect the performance benefit. So, so what we'll see that since some hard, of the hard disk are slower, high performance communication protocols may not have impact, and the SSDs and other storage technologies are emerging, and does it change the, the landscape? So with that, let me go into some details of our designs and, and case studies. Um, so we'll start with the, with the Hadoop. So if you take a look at the broad Hadoop architecture, so this is how the current generation architecture looks like. We have applications, HDFS, and the HDFS typically written with the Java sockets interface, and that Java socket interface runs with the 110 gig IP over IV network. Okay, so that's the current solution which is there. Now, if we want to move it to the IB verse, so here we have the InfiniMan and the IB verse. So what we had to bridge the gap, like let's say the HDFS write involves the replication, and these are the most network sen sensitive parts. Every time the data block comes, you are trying to write it through multiple nodes, and the HDFS read is mostly node local. So that means you are just reading from the from the local disk. So what we had to do is actually take these write calls, which is the Java native interface J and I, and then try to take it through the, our design and then put it into the IB verse. So those are the changes which we had to do. And so this way, like it says, J and I layer bridges the Java-based HDFS with communication library. And we just modified this part of the code. No other changes have been done, okay? But those are the second level of changes we need to do. I'll conclude with that because Many times what has happened, a lot of higher level algorithms or design have been done with the assumption that network is slow, okay? So it's like, uh, because these designs were done many years back with Ethernet in mind, saying Ethernet is slow, so I'll try to use at a higher level in such manner. But now, if you change the underlying, the implementation, and it becomes faster, then you need to revisit the upper layer. So we have not done that yet, okay? So only what we'll um, show the results are only these low-level changes, um, what, what we have done. So let's start with some of the basic HDFS. So here we are showing some numbers, like the, this is the focusing on the communication time of the, of the HDFS. And uh, so this, is, uh, this, this was run with uh, 32 hard disk, um, uh, like 32 servers with hard disk, and this paper was presented at the SC. Uh, 12 uh, in November, so you can take a complete look at the paper. But here we are comparing with, uh, let's say, one gigi, and then IP over IB with QDR, and this is our new design. So these are the three colors, one gigi numbers. This is the, the same QDR fabric, but one is running with IP over IB, and the other, another is running with the native IB. So here you'll see that as the file size is increasing, almost around least 10 gigabyte, we are able to reduce the communication time, okay, by almost 30%. And of course, with one gigi, there is benefits you expect because the infinite fabric is faster, uh, bandwidth wise, so, so we are seeing the, the benefits. Now that is just the communication time of the HDFS. But the question is, how, how does that translate into some end applications which, which is trying to utilize HDFS? So, so test DFS IO is a very common uh, benchmark which people use to evaluate uh, these uh, environments. So here, we use the same test DFS IO, and there are two, two of these clusters. So this is the 32 node cluster with hard disk. There are four nodes with, with SSDs. And here we see that on the, so this is like the average throughput, whatever is being reported by the test DFS IO. Um, so the throughput, these are the throughput numbers, so the higher is better. And here we see like around eight gigabyte file size, we see around 13% improvement, or in the, in the SSDs, uh, we see a little bit higher, like a 15% improvement. And, uh, and here we are talking about the QDR. We are, we are showing some of the numbers in a little bit older environment because those are the kind of common environments which are used. So here we are not using like the latest FTR or FTR 
dual FDR and all. Of course, one can use that, but many times the cost performance argument comes, so we are trying to show these numbers with a little bit few years older, um, older systems. So then this is the, the another kind of experiments we did, the same test FSIO, but now we try to do it the one hard disk versus two hard disks, okay? Uh, so here you will see like there are three numbers, so these are the, again, this is the average throughput, uh, so this is the one gigi versus this is one gigi with two, um, this is IP over IB, and then this is the OSU IB design, and these numbers are with two hard disks. So same systems, we had one hard disk, we took the numbers versus another times two hard disks. So, so here you will see that uh, these are like, these were run on four data nodes, uh, one hard disk per node, so here you will see that around 10% improvement um, uh, compared to the IP over IB. And the clusters with four data nodes, like once we change to like two hard disk, so here we see around a 16% improvement um, here. Now broadly, if you see the two hard disk versus one hard disk, obviously the two hard disk also helps over IP over IB. Okay, because we are talking about the data, now you have more disks, so they are being um, replicated into, into those disks. So here we get around 1.8 times improvement versus here like a factor of two, uh, two improvement uh, with, with the native design. So then we try to run another kind of experiments. Uh, this is with the YCSB. So this is a Ahu cloud um, service benchmark. And now I need to clarify that even the YCSB is using HBase, and then the HBase was another component. I'll show the later numbers or our design, but here the HBase was running with TCP IP. So you can mix and match these components in the Hadoop framework, okay? So only the HDFS was running over IB, and the HBase was using TCP IP, okay? So we just wanted to see with the HDFS IB, how it affects all the other, other components. And uh, here again, like this is the standard, uh, there are different ways you measure the uh, YCSP performance evaluation. So this is a single region server, 100% update. If you remember the HBase architecture I showed, we have the clients and then middle we have the, all the HBase servers and then we have the HDFS. So you can specify only you are using one region server or multiple region server. So here we saw like the average put latency for different kinds of number of records. Here it is 120,000 records, 240, 360, 480,000. Um, this is the latency, so the lower is better, and this side is the throughput, uh, the higher is better. Uh, so here we see like for 360K, um, so compared to this, like with IP over IB, it takes around 252 uh, uh, microseconds, and here we can give you a put latency of 204 microseconds, and that changes to here in terms of the of the throughput, like uh, we get around 4.42 kilops per second instead of 3.63. So roughly we see like a 20% improvement. So, so we are not changing any HDFS part, just the HDFS part. Um, sorry, we are not changing the HBase, but we still get like a 20% benefit from the HDFS side on the, on the HBase. So this is another like a 32 region server, 100% update. So that means more network uh, um, intensive operations are going on. And uh, this was again HBase using TCP IP. And the same thing again, this is the average latency, this is the average throughput. And here we see like around 26 improvement, 26% 26 improvement in latency and 24% improvement in, in throughput, okay? Any questions so far on the basic HDFS designs and numbers? Okay. So next, let me move to MapReduce. So the MapReduce, again, is, is another component, and the overall architecture looks like this. So, so we have the applications, and inside MapReduce also, like, there are communications between job tracker and task tracker. Uh, you go through the map phase, you go through the reduce phase, and, and the way the, the current generation architecture looks on the left-hand side, okay? So, so these, all these talk with the Java sockets interface, and there you can run it on the one or 10 gigi network. So to enable the RDMA communication, so we had to actually, again, similarly try to do, so this is the RDMA enabled map reduce, so we had to actually enable all these communications instead of going through the sockets, they go through the RDMA communications over InfiniMan, and the broad design is again similar to the previous one, so that we, we take the JNI calls and trap those calls and pass it through our designs uh, so that it can get translated to the IV horse level communication and then it can run on any of the RDMA capable networks. Now here, um, we try to do on the MapReduce framework, typically again, there are some standard benchmarks like sort, TerraSort kind of things, and that's what I'll show some numbers. Uh, so this is the evaluation using sort. Um, so here if you see like, again, this is a one gigi, this is the IP over IB QDR, 
and this is our new design. So, this is the execution time. So, around for 5 to 20 gigabit sort, uh, we used a 4 node cluster with single SSD for node. Um, and here we see like uh, around 15 gigabyte sort, we get around 46 percent improvement. Okay. So, just map reduce framework uh, we are trying to change. For the larger sort size, we increased also the number of nodes in the cluster. So, the data gets more balanced. And in this cluster, we had only single hard disk per node. And uh, for around 40 gigabyte sort, here if you see compared to this, this yellow line, the red line, we see around 27 percent improvement. Okay. And then the, the terasort, we also kept doing some more large scale things. So, the, so this is like a 30 gigabyte, 60 gigabyte, 100 gigabyte, and 200 gigabyte. And as the data size was increasing, we also like try to increase the cluster size, okay, uh, so that the data is more balanced and we are providing a fair comparison. And, uh, and these are like the cluster size and 4 and 8 had 24 gigabytes of RAM and these other cluster size 12 and 24 had uh, 12 gigabytes of RAM. And uh, so here we see like the 100 gigabyte sort, uh, if you see here like this line compared to here, we see around 41 percent improvement, okay. And, and also the MapReduce application is to be noted that because we are talking also in the memory. So, it is not just the storage, also the memory also plays a role because how much data is in the memory versus how much data you are going to the, to, to the other uh, disk remotely. So, there is a balance in between. So, all those things get reflected in the, in the performance numbers. Now, there is a new um, workload which has come from Purdue. If some of you are familiar, it is called Puma Purdue MapReduce Benchmark Suite. Okay? And they have actually made their code open. Um, so, we are able to take that and this has some different, it is like a workload. It is not an end application, but it is a workload providing representative behavior of different applications like let us say adjacency list or self join or word count is a common one, sequence count or inverted index. So, they have different of these this, this benchmarks. So, we try to take these benchmarks and then try to again uh, compare with our new design, the red lines versus the uh, the IP over IP solution. So, this is the execution time. Uh, so, the lower is, is better. Um, so, here we see um, around for 30 gigabytes. So, these workloads again you can run with different data size. Um, so, here we when we run with the 30 gigabytes data size, we see almost 47 6 percent improvement. So, means we are reducing the time by almost by factor of 2. And then here for a 50 gigabyte data size, we get around like 33 percent improvement. So, so these studies again show that look the RDMA based design also can, can help in the, in the map reduce uh, framework. So, then we have done the similar kind of things for the H base also and here what we did is we did a very detailed analysis of where the time is going. Okay? And this was presented at uh, ISPAS uh, conference last year. So, here what is trying to show like if you have different like let us say H base has this put and get operations, um, here we try to see. How, the, how much time is being spent in the client serialization versus client processing versus server serialization, server processing, communication preparation versus the actual communication. So, we wanted to isolate so that if you replace one network or one protocol versus another network and another protocol, where you can expect to gain. Okay? And, and as the, the analysis shows, so if you see that all the lower level like the client serialization, client processing, server installations, these are some tiny portions. Uh, server processing has some effect, but the major time here you see the actual communication. So, this is over 1 giggy, uh, IP over IB 10 giggy and this is our design which is the H base put with 1 kilobyte or H base get with 1 kilobyte. So, if you see the actual communication we are able to reduce from this, this region to, to, to here for a smaller part using our, our native design and same thing happens also with the get. So, here we almost get like a factor of 6 improvement compared to the 10 giggy. And for the gate operation also similar like a factor of 6 improvement uh, we get compared to the 10 gig. So, those are the analysis and then we did, did the design and the design is again no different. So, I will not repeat it. It is exactly similar because all these are Java framework. Once you do it for one component, you try to take similar designs for, for other components. So, we have taken the JNI approach and then uh, do this design on the right hand side. So, now here you will see that from the H base perspective, again there are different ways you measure the, the performance. So, here it is a single server, multiple clients. So, there is only one server, but multiple clients are trying to, trying to access. And here x axis we are trying to show the number of clients and then this is the kind of the time. Um, what we are saying this is for the uh, H base gate latency 
uh, and this is the operation for second, that is the transaction rate kind of things, uh, how many such operations you can do. Um, so here again, uh, there are similar kind of lines or trends we see like let's say this is the one gigi which is the black line, uh, this is the 10 gigi which is the blue line and the IP over light comes here and this is the native IV design. Um, so here we see like almost 27 percent improvement if you take a look at the 16 node client. Uh, latency wise we are able to pull it down over 10 gigi and, and here again we are able to push the, uh, push the throughput. Now this is a, the same uh, like a um, HBase uh, YCSB read write workload. Um, so, so you can actually have a read and write um, in a different manner or, or mix them. Um, so here we saw the same, same four lines uh, as the number of clients are increasing. So here we are able to scale it to 128 clients, um, read latency and the write latency. Um, so here we see like uh, compared to IP over IB which is the, this line. Uh, for 128 clients, so you will see that as the number of clients are increasing, uh, the low level design is, is in fact giving better and better benefits. So it is a scalable design. Um, so we get around 42 percent improvement here and for the gate latency we get around a 40 percent uh, improvement. Now then we, we saw all these things in an isolated manner and then the, our next thing was that if we add all these designs together because they can interoperate like one can still run with TCP IP or the sockets interface, one can run with IB, we tried to combine and so far we have just done this combined the HDFS and the HBase, okay, HDFS over IB and the HBase over, over IB. So here you will see that uh, the numbers what we are trying to show, so this is the HDFS and HBase integration over InfiniBand. So there are four lines here, so this line is, is the, like the one giggy. Uh, this is the IP over IB QDR and, and this is the HDFS is, is, is uh, running over the OSU IB and then the HBase. Uh, so this, this combination is the HDFS is running over IB uh, but HBase is still running over sockets, okay. And this is the final line, this is the red line which both are running over the infinite, okay. So, so as you can see that it is like this is the latency and this is the th throughput. Uh, so steadily like if you see the compared to these two lines like uh, running both over sockets versus one over sockets versus both, both over uh, the native InfiniBand. So when both are running over the native InfiniBand you get the best, best performance. So that we are getting an additive effect of these two different design HDFS and, and HBase. Uh, so this was done with the four region servers with 100 percent update and here we see that there is the 37 percent improvement over IP over IB and then 18 percent improvement over the over the OSU IBSDFS. So, so those are the kind of studies we have done um, with, with the Hadoop. If there are any quick questions, I can try to answer this before I go to Memcast. Any questions? Okay. So let's move ahead. So, so here we'll see that the the memcached as I said it is like a distributed uh, caching layer. So you are taking memory from all these different nodes and then trying to aggregate and but the other but here also because the clients can come you need to take a little bit of like a heterogeneity in mind, okay. Because the server side we can try to provide like here let us say the, the worker threads. Um, so in the existing design only sockets worker threads, we introduced verbs worker threads and they are trying to work on the shared data. But then the clients then can also, the request can also come from the sockets clients. We do not force any or put any limit saying the client also has to be RDM enabled, okay. So, so we designed in such a manner so that the either the clients are RDMA clients or socket clients, they can talk here and, and with the RDMA clients they get assigned to the, to the master thread and then they go to the worst worker thread whereas the socket clients can go through the traditional path. So that we can coexist both kinds of old client and the, and the new client. And, uh, so, and then here this, this was done with the memcached server again 1.4.9, uh, the memcached client was the version 0 0.52. Now here if you see some of the numbers, so this is like the memcached gate latency um, for small messages. Um, so here we are saying like these were two different cluster, in fact this was a little bit earlier work, so even we did some evaluation with the DDR, uh, not just QDR but the previous generation uh, DDR cluster and then these are the QDR. Um, so here you will see that, so this is a multiple different lines. So this is like a one gigi line which is the, uh, which is the black and then we have the IP over IB here and then this is the 
uh, the, the blue line is the SDP line and then the green line is the 10 gigi and then this is the, uh, the, the new OSU design. But we also carried out here two different design. Yesterday I introduced like the, uh, the design can, because we are talking about InfiniMan, it can go through unreliable datagram which is UD or it can go through RC which is a reliable connection and we can also combine to make it a hybrid just like what, what we have done with the MPI. So here you will see that, that with the four bytes um, gate latency, um, here we are able to like DDR or QDR, we are able to improve the performance of course. So QDR is around like a 4.28 microseconds, we can do it, uh, two kilobyte again at the QDR, uh, we can do 8.19 and broadly there is a big difference here compared to what you can get with IP over IB or with, a, excuse me, the, the SDP. Well, we are able to improve the performance uh, significantly and here we see like compared to 10 gigi toe, uh, for around two kilobytes, we get around a factor of four improvement. Okay. So then the memcached gate transactions for second, so that was like the four small messages. So here is the, the transaction, the higher is better. Um, so here you can see big difference, like in the four clients versus eight clients and here uh, these are the thousands of uh, transactions per second um, and these are the number of clients. We are able to scale it to up to like a thousand, uh, thousand twenty-four thousand clients and here we say like the memcached gate transactions per second uh, for four bytes um, with a, these are the lines like uh, here we go with the, this is the RC design and then uh, this is the UD design. Um, so here we are able to go into almost into a million transactions per second uh, with, with uh, eight clients here, so this is very close to 1.4 uh, million transactions or 1.3 million transactions, whereas the other protocols are remaining very low, like 100, 150 um, uh, thousand transactions per second. And uh, there is another uh, benchmarks we took, uh, which is called Olio benchmark, which comes with the, with the Memcached uh, software stack. Um, and here again, we see similar kind of trends. So this is the time, um, both, both are in time. And whereas here, uh, for large number of clients, actually we use the hybrid design by combining the RC and UD. Like yesterday, I had given this example of the hybrid car design, the same things uh, here we have done. Uh, so for RC, here if you see like a, with around 1.6, 1.9 seconds kind of things, so these are the numbers um, we can give. It's almost like compared to IP over IB, which is almost four, four times faster. Um, we can try to deliver. And then if you see the hybrid design, um, just like I mentioned yesterday, like UD and uh, this is the RC, this is the, our hybrid design, always performs equal or better than RC or UD and tries to also reduce the, the memory footprint. Then uh, we, uh, one of my former students is, is at Yahoo. Um, so we, we worked with him uh, to change some of their workload, like the, whatever the advertising workload they do uh, to, to bring a, synthetic benchmarks which reflects that workload. Of course, uh, Yahoo cannot share that uh, with us publicly, but, but he was able to come up with a workload which mimics uh, their uh, advertising workload. And, and here again, we, with that kind of an application uh, workload, uh, we were able to see like these are the SDP, this is IP over IB, but these are the new designs uh, with, with InfiniMan. So, so here we were able to get around almost 12 times better uh, for, um, for, for eight clients and as we scaled the things to almost 1,000 clients, uh, we are again the seeing that the hybrid design was almost giving the comparable performance to that of the pure RC design and we didn't have the memory footprint issues of the RC and we were able to reduce it to a uh, smaller part, okay. So, so to coming back to this, uh, this uh, bigger picture, so, so far we have just done some initial studies in these directions. We have just focused on only point-to-point -point communication and the IO file system. We have not touched to touched any of these. Um, we are continuing to work in along these directions, but the more important things what we see is that we need to make some upper level changes, okay? So it's just the lower level changes are not sufficient. Here, yes, I showed some good numbers, but there is a much more potential because all this upper level design or the architecture was done with slower network in mind. Uh, so we need to rethink how that gets modified uh, or how that can be modified to actually match with the high performance uh, networks. And if we can do that, in fact, that will give us, in fact, much more uh, potential benefits. Um, 
So, so to conclude here, um, the, what I have shown here is some initial designs to take advantage of the InfiniBand and the RDMA for HDFS, MapReduce, HBase, and MemcacheD. The results are promising. Uh, we are trying to work on integrate the designs of all these components so that just like our MPI software stack, we can actually put all these things together and then make it available so that user can actually try to uh, try to utilize that. That is our plan, but it will take, take us a little bit more time uh, to put all these things together, test them out uh, so that everything, everything work. Uh, but uh, there are many other open issues need to be solved, including the design changes at the, at the upper layers. And the other, other thing in this, this framework is that unlike MPI and PGAS and all, because uh, scientific computing has been there for so many years, there are so many different applications and benchmarks you can get publicly in an open source form so that uh, you can actually evaluate. Whereas in this kind of things, still it is very closed. I mean, each company, Facebook has its own. Of course, they have made some things open, but every, everybody is trying to keep their own things. Uh, so as a community, I think things need to be make, made more open so that then only we can carry out performance evaluation across different designs, different systems, and then see uh, what uh, works out with the best. Um, so if we can do that, uh, we expect that it will enable the big data community to take advantage of all these modern clusters, as well as Hadoop middleware to carry out their analytics in, in a fast and scalable manner. So everybody's talking about this, but I think we have several years to, to really come up with the end solution where things can be deployed. Uh, so with this, let me conclude here, and then uh, if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to, to cover them. Yes? Um, is the researchers you talk to, is performance something that's getting in their way when they're removing these kind of tasks, or is it just limiting what they can explore? Um, I mean, the, everybody wants better, okay? I mean, that is the, always like in the in the... Uh, today, they are handling, like, let's say, um, Yahoo is handling so many um, advertisement transactions per second. They also want to go to the next level, okay? Uh, but once again, as I said, they don't, they don't say publicly, okay, that I need this or I want to go to the next level. A lot of these informations are all internal to, to these different companies. And I hope that that will, with this kind of research and all, it will change the... Um, mentality or attitude from different companies um, so that things can be discussed in a much more open manner and we'll see what kind of scalable solutions can be provided. That, that is my perspective. If others have different perspective, can, can share. Yes? Um, I don't have any of those. Might be Brent if he has or somebody else has. Uh, so, so these two communities are going differently. I mean, now only the, like, Luster is trying to bring the HDFS back, so, so there will be some kind of an integration, but the whole Hadoop framework has been designed with HDFS, okay? So, in fact, many times in the HDFS, it takes a lot of time to load the data. I mean, that is actually a big challenge, okay? Because once you load, this is where the HDFS write takes place. If you want to experiment with the 100 gigabytes of data, First, you have to load it, okay, to, to your HDFS environment, and that takes more, much more time, and then only you can perform the experiments, and this is where the luster integration will help a little bit. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you. <laughs>